Hi guys, welcome back to This Old Thing. I'm Jessie Sage, and today we're reading The Girl in the Centerfold by Saray Marsh. We're going to be reading chapter two and three, and possibly a little farther, just depending, maybe four, depending how far we get, because some of the chapters are shorter than others. If you miss chapter one and you need to go back to the beginning, I'll put it down in the info box below, and I'll also put them all in a playlist so that you can just press play and just kind of listen through as we go. I also just did a chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter one discussion. So just a brief kind of overview of a couple of points that I had, and I'd love to know what you guys thought about chapter one as well. So that will be in the info box below as well. One quick little bit of housekeeping on this book is I just want to make sure that everyone understands that there is a trigger warning over this whole book because there are a lot of things that are triggering in this book and sometimes I don't know when they're coming up <clears throat> because sometimes they're just thrown out there quickly. It's not like a whole chapter about it. So I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that because I don't want anyone to be upset. But this is an upsetting book, so <laughs> get ready. <laughs> um, I mean, not. I'm not saying like, oh, it's super disturbing. It's just if you read about Playboy at all, that's it's a disturbing topic. So, oh, I also want to give a shout out to my shirt, which is one of my favorite things that I have. It is this Anna Nicole shirt, and it is from a rare collection by Primitive Skateboarding. The photo is by Daniela Federici, and was the shot at the Playboy Mansion? Maybe it was at her house. There's a there's an off chance that this was actually shot at the mansion, but I think I might be wrong about that. But yeah, anyway, so let's get on to chapter two. Let me get a sip of my tea before we get going. Chapter 2. Koss Cobb. It seems rather ironic, perhaps even funny now, but when I left Norway for America I was wearing my best dark blue suit, which had the sleeves, collar, and hat trimmed in white fur. Bunny fur. At that time I'd never heard of any but the furry, four-legged kind, and my costume was appropriate. <clears throat> it was November 22, 1965, cold in Norway and none too warm in New York which I reached after a brief stop in Denmark. Sorry, playboy, but that was my only visit there. I was thrilled beyond reason as I boarded the plane to think I was going to America, to New York. A whole new life was opening up for me. What wonderful, strange things would happen. I'd be famous, rich, America. Compared to spending a night away from home, this was the atomic bomb. Too bad it became an anatomic bomb and that Anna, anatomic bomb? One second, I hear my roommate's dog barking. I forgot to close the door. Okay, we're back. I was beyond reason. Looking back on that day, I must say I was gutty but dumb. First of all, I was just a few days past my 18th birthday. Second, I had no money. Of course, I didn't figure to need any. I had a job. Third, I was no expert in housework, the job I had, nor did I have any great enthusiasm for it. Fourth, I knew only two people in America. One was a young American student I'd met that summer. I promised to look him up in New York. The other was a Norwegian girl named Berit, who was a domestic in a home on Long Island. <clears throat> like, I don't have to cough, and as soon as I start reading to you guys, I do. Somewhere on the plane with me, I didn't meet her until just before we landed, was Lila, a Swedish girl whom the same agency was sending over. Lila was a very nice, sweet-faced, rather plump girl who, to my great good fortune, was to work for a family living almost next door to my family. The main reason I was dumb was that I knew considerably less English than I know today. 
I'd studied it in school, but little had soaked in. I knew some words, words such as I am, you are, she is, cat, dog, hello, and yes. I guess I didn't know no. I can illustrate just how naive I was by relating an encounter on the trip. A gentleman sat next to me. He was an American in his 50s and very nice. We managed to con converse, for he knew little Norwegian. <clears throat> he knew a little Norwegian. He found out who I was and where I was going, then said, Six months from now, you won't know yourself. You'll be wearing false eyelashes, false nails, false hair. I thought he was out of his mind. Who ever heard of false eyelashes, hair, and nails? Certainly not me. The plane trip seemed to take forever, because I was so eager to see New York. Were the buildings really so tall? I was to be a while finding out, for the agency met Lila and me at Kennedy Airport and whisked us directly to Cos Cobb. I never even saw the skyline. Cos Cobb is a rather elegant ex-urban community just over the New York line in Connecticut. It is on the Long Island Sound and quite lovely, and many New York commuters live there. Myself, I've never been to Cos Cobb. As in the case of Alborg, Denmark, I'm lying again. My employers lived elsewhere in that general area. I've changed their hometown along with their names and other identifying facts to conceal who they are. This family never did me any harm and I have no wish to cause them any embarrassment. Why cause Cobb? I just like the sound of it. <clears throat> to make a perhaps unparalleled statement of biographical fabrications, the Rich family consisted of Mr. Rich, 31, Mrs. Rich, 27, and their two darling children. Mr. Rich was, as they say, in business, or more accurately, his father was in business. He, meaning my employer, seemed pleasant enough, but I hardly ever saw him. I'm sure if he worked, I'm sure he worked hard, if only because the home in Cross Cobb qualified as a contemporary Taj Mahal. Or so it seemed to me. <clears throat> it certainly was no four rooms farmhouse in Store Elvedal. Mrs. Rich, whom I didn't see a lot, whole lot of either, was very pretty and very well dressed and very sophisticated. At least she kept her nose elevated a good bit. But I have no complaints about her. She really was very nice. Oh, there were a few things I wish might have been different. The uniform, for one. It had been provided for the previous maid. I believe her name was Kate Smith. Every time my mistress would see me, ballooned in white cotton to my ankles, she said, oh, I must get you a new uni uniform. She never did. Too bad, the old one would have made a marvelous parachute if the army ever wanted to airdrop a tank. My contract called for me to earn my airfare by working for a year. In addition, I received $25 a week spending money with every Thursday and every other Sunday off. <clears throat> in return, I was to clean the house, make the beds, do the dishes, launder and iron the clothes, and cook some of the meals. My day began at 7 a.m. and ended at 9 p.m. if I wasn't babysitting, which was nearly every evening. I worked hard, but I didn't mind the housework. What did me in were Billy, three, and Mary, five. I don't wish to exaggerate, but if all American children are like these two, the United States doesn't need age bombs. Just drop your kids on Russia. Or just drop your kids on Russia. To illustrate, my first afternoon, Mrs. Rich instructed me in my duties. The most important thing is to get the children up and off to nursery school, she said. I nodded. The bus comes at 8 o'clock, so you get them up at 7, get them dressed, and feed them breakfast. I nodded. They usually eat cold cereal, but sometimes I give them hot cereal, you know, oatmeal. Sometimes I make them pancakes, occasionally an egg. What could be simpler? Oh, these affluent Americans. Such a variety of foods. The next morning, I bounded from bed, eager to start my first day at work in the new world. The children were already awake. I started them dressing and ran to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. It was a cold, blustery, late November morning.
It seemed to me that a nice steaming bowl of oatmeal would give them a fine start on the day. I boiled a pot of water and mixed in the oatmeal. It even looked good to me. I was just putting the bowls on the table as Billy and Mary came in for breakfast. <clears throat> good morning, children, I said again. I was very cheery. Yeah, they said, or words to that effect. Yeah, lots of screaming. I'd never heard such screams. American children must be the greatest screamers in the world. And I didn't know what they were screaming about. I thought they maybe there was a bug or something in the oatmeal. No, it looked fine to me. Could it be me? I was sort of an apparition in my uniform. It didn't stop until Mrs. Rich ran in from her bedroom. What happened? Who's hurt? I tried to explain, but the children screamed. No one! No like! Mrs. Rich seemed to understand the problem. Oh dear. All right, children, be quiet. It'll be all right. Their noise stopped as abruptly as it began. What's wrong? I asked. She smiled. I'm afraid the children don't like your breakfast. Oh, it's oatmeal. It's good. <laughs> she smiled again, much as if she were shake, shaking hands with a chicken plucker. I'm sure it is, but you see, the children don't want oatmeal. She shook her head. It's my fault. I forgot to tell you to ask the children what they want for breakfast. Ask? Children? But I forced a smile, nodded that I understood, and she left the kitchen. It was difficult for me to accept that children got to choose breakfast, but I shrugged, smiled, and asked what they wanted for breakfast. Cereal. Fine. I went to the cupboard and flung it open. I had never seen so much cereal. There were at least a dozen different brands. What would you like? No answer. They were two faces in the candy store window. I smiled. How about some nice cornflakes? They shook their head. No cornflakes. Puffed rice? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> no puffed rice. Alphabets? Not that either. Cheerios? Sugar Pops? Tricks? Captain Crunch? Frostios? Each brought silence, negative head shakes, or unison shouts of no. Sugar crisp? Billy and Mary hesitated. I brought the box out of the cupboard. At last. Sugar crisp it would be. No like that. Oh lord, I glanced at the clock ten minutes before the bus left. You've got to eat, children. I know you'll like sugar crisp. I started to pour it into the bowls. Yeah, they started screaming. All right, all right. I went through the remaining cereal. Shredded wheat. Lucky Charms, Cocoa Crisp. I tried to be a salesman. This is so good, I said, smacking my lips. You'll like this. Yum, yum. I even rubbed my tummy. Actually, I'd never tasted any of them. Apparently, they had. They didn't want any of the family cereals. I was desperate. It was five of eight. I had to get them off to nursery school. Children, I pleaded. What do you want? Such darlings, such wonderful children, in unison, pancakes. In five minutes, I was to prepare pancakes? They never did eat. I'm not exaggerating. This is precisely what happened. If you want to say these were just high-spirited kids putting one over on the new girl in town, you're wrong. Breakfast never did get much better, and that was the least of it. Bedtime was disaster, Bill. They left the bathroom in a shambles. They never picked up a toy, and they had what seemed like thousands. Billy, only three, mercifully would run out of gas and collapse, but Mary was a human dynamo. She would go, baby, go, particularly at 9 p.m., up, down, into this, into that, pretending sleep, and she screamed if I got mad. This went on almost every night, for the riches usually went out, leaving me to babysit. And the sounds of happy laughter? Would you believe whining, fighting, and screaming? Sometimes I felt like every nerve was bleeding. I tried everything with these kids. I gave in to them. I tried to be their buddy. I spanked them. I threatened them. I ignored them, or tried to. Nothing worked. As far as I could discover, they were incorrigible, fresh out of Sing Sing. There were times when I thought I'd blow my mind. I felt totally trapped, sentenced to a year's servitude with two diabolical dwarfs. They couldn't be children. 
A couple of things preserved my sanity, Thursday and Lila. During the afternoon, Lila and I could often chat on the phone or get together for a cup of tea and pour out our troubles to each other. On most Thursdays, we took the train to New York. The first time we went, we did the usual tourist bit, Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, window shopping, gawking at tall buildings. By the second visit, Lila and I both wanted some fun. We were domesticated to death. We wanted to be around people our own age, preferably those who spoke a familiar tongue. From Berit, the Norwegian girl on Long Island, we got the name of the Lorelei. It was a German restaurant, she said, but lots of Scandinav Scandinavians went there. Our efforts to find the Lorelei prove how naive Lila and I were. In Oslo, if you want to locate a restaurant, you ask somebody. They tell you. So when we got out of Grand Central onto 42nd Street, we asked some people where the Lorelei was. Mostly, they looked at us like we were crazy. <clears throat> Finally, a cop said he thought it was on 52nd Street. We took a, we took a cab there. After trudging along for a while, we were unable to find the Lorelei. We started asking people again, but only got shrugs, head shakes, and I don't knows. You might ask why we didn't look in the phone book. Simple. We didn't think of it. Finally, after a long time, we happened upon a German couple. They knew the Lorelei. 86th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues, and so it was at last. The Lorelei became my home away from home. I went there often. It was a place to laugh and sing and be with members of the human race. I had one other diversion, Freddy. He was the tourist I had met in Oslo that summer. We had held hands and exchanged letters, and I liked him a lot. He had met my plane when I landed in New York, and we met again on one of my early Thursdays. Freddy was a law student and very busy in school. Columbia, I guess. He came from a good family who didn't approve of me or his seeing me, but I didn't care. I adored Freddy. He was very handsome and had a beautiful body, and he was very nice to me. I was so in, I was in love, or thought I was. Six days a week, I was so lonely. On the seventh was Freddy. He talked, and I listened to the sound of his voice. He took me to the Lorelei, and we had fun. We also went to bed. I don't remember much about the sexual part of our relationship. I know I felt that everything about Freddy, just knowing him and loving him, was a great adventure. And sex was part of the adventure. I just let it happen. I didn't struggle or protest. Oh, I was scared, but I was also tired of virginity. There had been so much fuss about it from my parents and all my friends in Oslo, I wanted to get it over with. And Freddy was so nice, and I loved him. In books and movies, the first time is supposed to be so great. Looking back on it, I can say that Freddy wasn't very experienced, and I sure wasn't. All I can say about the first and the several times it followed is that it was all dreadfully dull. I saw Freddy about once a week for a couple of months. Once he came up to Cost Cobb to visit me while I was babysitting. But Freddy and I just drifted apart. Law students are busy, I guess. Lila, Freddy, the Lorelei, and Thursday. That's about all there was in my life. I'd come to America expectantly. A great adventure was to unfold. Instead, I got little tastes of it one day a week, and six days of Billy and Mary. I began to break down, awakening each morning to dread the tantrums, the screams, the crisis, crises, the futility of the day. I was on edge all the time. I cried more than I ever had in my life. I know I shouldn't blame the children. I know that at age 18, I should have been able to control three- and five-year-old children. I know it must be some defect in my character, but liking children, I could see these two only as monsters. I didn't understand them at all. The end came in February 1966, less than three months after I arrived in Cos Cobb. The riches went on a cruise, leaving me with the children. An elderly woman was hired to help with the cooking and housework. She was the last straw. She never stopped talking, ranting constantly in a whiny voice about all the misfortunes life had brought her. I couldn't escape her voice. I held my hands over my ears and still her voice came through. She, together with the children, who decided Old Home Week had arrived at last now that their parents were away, were too much. I felt like I was being burned at the stake. But what could I do? I had a contract. I couldn't leave. Where would I go if I did? 
On my Thursday escape to the Lorelei, I met Larry, who listened to my woes. He insisted there must be some way out. He had a lawyer friend he'd talked to. Early the next week he called, the lawyer had said I didn't have to stay, and Larry knew two Swedish girls I could move in with. He'd drive up and bring me back into the city. I went. It was evening when I arrived in Manhattan with Larry, and it seemed there was a hitch. The two Swedish girls wouldn't be ready for me until the next day. He'd have to put me up in a hotel for the night. I'm afraid he got his directions missed. We went up into a hotel on the west side, all right, but then I was expected to go down on the bed. I protested. I didn't want to. He insisted. He was helping me. He'd found me a place to live, and why not, and what was wrong? I felt I had no other place to go, so... The next day, when I moved in with the girls, I discovered they had been expecting me the night before. Good old Larry. True blue Larry. I stayed with the girls two weeks, then moved into a residence hotel on 94th Street. Shortly after I left Costco, I reported into the agency which had hired me, fully expecting that they would try to force me to return, which I wasn't about to do. To my surprise, the woman at the agency was sympathetic. You're the fifth girl who's left them, she said. My flight from Costco did have some repercussions. Mrs. Rich hired a detective to find me. Eventually, it was agreed I should reimburse them for my airfare, and I did pay them some money. My next job was a domestic with a family on Manhattan's west side. They were a nice couple who both worked. Their son, three years old, was a quiet little boy. I rather liked it there, but I stayed only a month. In March, one of my dates took me to the Flick, an ice cream parlor in the East 50s. The manager asked me if I'd like a job as a waitress. I took it. As a waitress in the Flick, I wore red leotards, red net stockings, red high heel shoes, and a straw hat, also red. On a good day, I could make about $20 a day in wages and tips, which was more money than I'd yet seen in this land of opportunity. I sort of enjoyed the job. The costume wasn't too brief, and I felt pretty in it, and I got a lot of reaction from the customers. One fellow said, you ought to be a bunny. I thought it was a line. Don't you think I ought to get married first? He laughed. I mean a playboy bunny. Is that a different kind? You mean you've never heard of playboy? Bunnies? Should I have? He was astounded, shaking his head in disbelief. Playboy's an American magazine. You must have seen it. It's the one with the nude girl on the centerfold. Suddenly I remembered. I'd gone to a party at a fellow's apartment in Oslo. He had a wall covered with nude pictures, which everyone looked at and laughed over. He said they came from Playboy. I had been terribly shocked. What sort of girl would ever do anything like that? I'm not going to be a bunny, mister. Nobody's going to paste me on their walls. No, no, you misunderstand. The nudes are called playmates. A bunny is a waitress in the Playboy Club. She serves food and drinks. A bunny? He had to be pulling my leg. Instead of a waitress, she's called a bunny. They wear a costume about like the one you're wearing, only they have a hat with ears sticking up. Oh yeah, and a little cotton tail behind. I laughed. Now I was sure he was kidding. But he insisted. I'm serious. A lot of girls work there. Maybe two or three hundred. Look, they'd hire you. You'd make a lot more than you do here. I have other customers, mister. I've got to run, really. Several minutes went by while I served the sodas and sundaes as my contribution to American obesity. I tried to ignore the customer. The joke had gone far enough. Yet, I wasn't sure it was a joke. Are you kidding about these these bunnies or whatever you call them? Look, I'm dead serious. Ask anybody. I wasn't sure I believed him, but I was intrigued. How much would I make there? I don't know exactly. I understand the girls make $150, $200 a week. So much. Some make more, I guess. You'd be good at it. And why work here when you can make twice as much for doing practically the same thing? I hesitated. I'm sure he knew I was interested. 
I know Tony Roma, the general manager of the Playboy Club. Why don't I call him? Arrange an appointment for you. Then you can see for yourself. I heard myself say, okay. So that's the end of chapter two. My candle just started making sounds. I hope that you guys can't hear that. <laughs> All right, chapter three. Bunny Salve. Tony Roma, the general manager of the New York Playboy Club, was a man of about 45. He was of Italian extraction, with dark, wavy hair, fairly tall, with a trim physique. Tony Roma had once been an actor, which was not difficult to understand, for he was very handsome and debonair in his dark business suit. Most charming, poised, urbane, emancipated. I guess he was very good at whatever general managers of Playboy Clubs do, for he headed an important club in Mr. Hefner's chain. He now manages the Montreal Club. I've often tried to figure out why his first words were, how do you like to pose for the centerfold, be a playmate? I don't think it is customary. The whole Playboy organization from Hefner on down, contrary to the public impression, is very businesslike. They pay well for almost everything, but they demand what they consider quality. This is perhaps another way of saying Playboy minds the buck. Perhaps Tony Roma said that because he was unaccustomed to interviewing prospective bunnies. I learned later that new bunnies are hired by the bunny mother. One could call her a head rabbit, <laughs> but foreman would probably have more meaning. Maybe Tony Roma had never hired a bunny before. Maybe he didn't know what to say. Maybe he was kidding. Maybe he meant it and figured I'd do a strip right there in the office. I don't know. <clears throat> Is this the Tony Roma from the state house? <clears throat> it might be a temptation for some in that situation to assume they were so gorgeous that receiving such a proposal was merely inevitable. I've never felt that way myself. I know beautiful girls who think of themselves as ugly and are constantly needing to have their beauty proved to them. And I know beautiful girls who think of themselves as absolutely stunning. You poor wretch. I've always been rather pragmatic about myself. I'm pretty, but no particular beauty. I've recently cut my hair short, but until then I'd always worn it rather long. Natural blondes with long hair, fair skin, and blue eyes are usually attractive. In my case, I think my chin is a little weak and my cheeks a bit cherubic. I wouldn't mind if those features were improved, nor do I think I have a particularly great figure. I'm a little thing, 5'2", 98 pounds, 35, 23, 34, and not very big anywhere. I never could figure out what I was doing in a magazine that glorifies boobies. I never felt like entering any contests. I prove it by giving my cup size, but I really don't know it. I seldom wear a bra. I've never needed one. And who wants to wear a harness? I like my freedom. At the same time, I'm not going to put myself down. I know men usually find me attractive and desirable, and women don't. I swear I don't do anything to get either reaction, but it happens. It happens. So, I don't know why Tony Roma said, How do you like to pose for the centerfold? Be a playmate. I said, absolutely not, stood up and started to walk out of his office. Wait, he said, you don't have to be a playmate. I just thought you might like to. If you want to be a bunny, sit down. We'll talk about it. He seemed amused. Reluctantly, distrustfully, I sat down. When I said absolutely, I meant positively. I was not being coy. The idea of posing in the nude was totally repugnant to me. All I could think of was the pinups on the wall in Oslo and the consternation that any girl had done it. You'd have to be a prostitute or a professional stripper or a slut or sick to do it. Oh, I know, by some standards, I was already one of those, but those standards aren't my standards. One of the widest ca chasms in the generation gap, whether in Norway or in America, is the concept of what used to be called the fallen woman. The idea that a girl is either a virgin or a whore. It just isn't so. I've already mentioned two different men. 
At the time I was dating the third, George. I wasn't in love with George, but he fascinated me. George had money, or his father did. George had a swanky apartment with maid service, a new car, a closet full of suits, bar, hi-fi, everything. He lived like Hollywood. We met at the Lorelei and he invited me to a party. Later he asked me to spend the night at his place and I did. I saw George once or twice a week from the time I left Cos Cobb until shortly after I went to work at the Playboy Club. There wasn't much sex between us, but what there was I didn't feel guilty about. We had fun. There was dinner and discotheking and fun people. I wasn't lonely with George. Personally, I didn't get much out of the sex except for being warm and cuddled and adventuresome, and he, but he seemed to be happy. It was a small price to pay. My point is that being no longer virginal didn't mean I'd lost all sense of values. I started to smoke, but I still didn't drink much. Still don't. I wasn't robbing banks and pushing little old ladies into the gutter, and I wasn't a girl who posed in the nude to be plastered onto walls. There was no great problem in being hired as a bunny. If I filled out an application, I don't remember it. Tony Roma explained that I was to be the door bunny. This meant I was to stand by the door and greet the club members as they came in, saying, good afternoon, welcome to the Playboy Club. I was not to say hello, or hi there, handsome, or how do you like to pose for the centerfold, cutie? I was to say, good afternoon, welcome to the Playboy Club, and not a word different. In fact, the only issue about my employment was my ability to render the proper greeting. Now, Solvay, try it. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. I tried it. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. Your accent's all right. Kind of sexy, in fact. Try it again. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. No, mean it. Make the people feel welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. That's better, but you have to smile. We want warmth. You're absolutely delighted to see them. I rendered my biggest grin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. That's better. Try it again. I tried. I tried. Great. Just great. You'll do fine. But practice it. Say it over and over tonight. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. Tony Romo was very nice to me. He outfitted me with a used bunny costume until my own were ready, and he lent me the money to buy the shoes to go with it. More significantly, he paid me an extra salary. I was hired at $25 a day, $125 a week. After three days, he gave me a $5 a day raise. It was more than I'd ever dreamed of. When you work in a Playboy club, you rather assume the sun rises and sets there. The place is so jammed that you figure every male over the age of 12 must be a member. Realistically, this isn't so. There are only a handful of clubs in principal cities. As big as the clubs are, they can accommodate only a few hundred members. So it must be assumed that most people have never set foot in a Playboy club. Therefore, it is appropriate to start at the beginning. A Playboy club is basically a restaurant with bar service. The drinks are generous, but cost $1.50 a piece. The food, to be kindly, is at best acceptable. It is hard to imagine Duncan Hines or Craig Claiborne suggesting the New York club as the best meal in town. They probably shudder. The fare is simple, mostly steaks. The menu is short, the chefs, again, to be kindly, uninspired. The tables are diminutive and placed so close together one has to squeeze into a seat and watch your elbows while eating. And did, you did use a deodorant, didn't you? Truly, at rush hours, the Playboy Club is a study in the problems of the population explosion. The service is basically simple and perfunctory. No comparison can be made with the leisurely, gracious service of a fine restaurant. 
Despite all of these liabilities, the Playboy Clubs are an undeniable success. Men shell out $50 for a key or membership, then return again and again. And in New York, there are hundreds of interesting restaurants they could go to. In analyzing the reasons for the club's success, one has to start with the decor, which might be described as contemporary lavish. The club is divided into rooms, all small, decorated in various themes, and always posh, plush, and luxury. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. And always posh, plush, and luxurious. Certainly, the member buys decor. There is entertainment. Combos, singers, comedians, dancers, and little acts by bunnies occur regularly. Most are good, some first rate. And all the clubs except the New York and Atlanta clubs, where the liquor boards do not permit it, patrons can occasionally dance with a bunny, within limits. According to the Playboy Club Bunny Manual, a 50-page list of do's and don'ts for bunnies, Bunnies may, one, have their picture taken with patrons, provided there is no physical contact whatsoever, and two, dance with patrons at the feature dance party, provided there is no close physical contact, e.g. twist, watusi, etc. So, drinking, dancing, and being entertained, perhaps the patrons have fun. But it seems to me that a lot of places have that. More likely reason for success of the clubs is the success of Playboy magazine. The Playboy club, it seems to me, is merely a physical extension of the Playboy fantasy. When the member enters, he figuratively carries Playboy in with him. He becomes what Playboy says a Playboy is. Sophisticated, urbane, emancipated, fun-loving, a wee bit wicked. For an hour or two, he is living in a fantasy land of gorgeous, willing women. Celebrities, the jet set, wine, women, song, and 23 skidoo. The whole atmosphere of Playboy rubs off, and the patron, whether male or female, feels very with it. But the vital ingredient of the Playboy clubs are the bunnies. If the bunnies were removed and waiters and white jackets substituted, the whole system would collapse. It may be argued that the bunny is just a waitress serving food and drink, just like tens of thousands of other hash slingers. But it, it isn't so. The bunny manual contains a section entitled, What is a Bunny? It is illuminating. Playboy would have you imagine yourself at a very elegant, sophisticated cocktail party where you are about to meet the most beautiful girl you've ever seen. To your surprise, she is not reserved or aloof. She gives you a big, sincere smile and says, Hi, my name is Pat. Is this the same... Sorry. It is the same disarming experience that charms members and guests whenever they are greeted by a Playboy bunny. A bunny is beautiful and desirable, but she is also warm, friendly, nice young lady. She expects to like the people she meets, and she expects them to like her. She is projecting what we term the bunny image. And that's from the bunny manual. Consider the customer. From the moment he enters, his eye is constantly affixed upon really remarkably attractive girls. All young, all desirable, and all dressed in an outfit cunningly designed to accentuate and then reveal a deep cleavage and half her hindy. She smiles at him, says, I'm Bunny Pat, or whatever her name is, and comes around regularly to cater to his every wish and comfort. The result, I submit, is instant fantasy. What male, and that includes college boys and octogenarians, priests and bon vivants, would not be flattered to have a gorgeous girl caring just for him, exposing most of herself to him, being available for his admiration and stimulation. And he has safety. He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to touch her, feed her a line, prove his bedsmanship. Without doing anything but breathing and keeping his eyes open, he gets an injection of virility, masculinity, urbanity, and fantasy. She did seem to like me. Wouldn't it be something to have a girl like that? The bunny is the walking representation of the playboy fantasy. Look, don't touch. Enjoy her. Make use of her. That's all she wants. She is there for no other purpose. Your admiration, your enjoyment, your presence are all she asks. Nothing is demanded of you. Nothing, nothing at all. You're a man, a whole man. Dream, man, dream. 
The bunny fantasy is no accident. It is calculated to the nth degree. The bunny manual spells this out in spades. <clears throat> Everything she says or does is carefully prescribed. For example, rule 521.1.3 of the bunny manual, the proper approach commands the bunny to, quote, use the assurance phrase, I'll be with you in a moment, sir, smile, and introduce herself with a standard bunny introduction. Good evening, I'm your bunny name. May I see the member's key, please? The bunny must record this information on the check along with the date, the number of guests, and her station number and name. And then she is to ask, is the key listed under your name, sir? If the fellow says yes, she gets his full name, last name first, and makes sure she has the correct spelling. If the patron says no, she is to ask, under whose name is this key listed, please? Then write that as well as the name of the person using the key. Next, she says, now, I'll be happy to take your order, remembering always to ask for ladies' orders first. She never, never asks for an order in a crude or trite phrase such as, what'll you have? Or, your order? She is always friendly. If ladies are present, she always asks, may I take the or may I take the ladies' order now, please, Mr. So-and-so? That is all she says, except for possibly, do you care for cocktails, sir? Rule 520.2.8 forgives any and all mingling with guests, and mingling is defined as dating, any physical contact, fraternizing, or socializing with patrons or guests. Mingling is very bad, and the bunny who mingles can be fired. A person might reasonably ask how the bunny is to be the warm, friendly, nice young lady if she can't mingle. <clears throat> the manual's answer is for her to briefly converse with patrons, as long as she restricts herself to polite formalities and information about the Playboy Club. Under no circumstances is she to provide any personal information about herself or other bunnies, such as last names, phone numbers, addresses, or vital statistics. Playboy's great concern about the moral fiber of bunnies is again demonstrated in Rule 520.2.3 which again forbids the giving out of names, addresses, or phone numbers. Just in case a girl has any doubt, there is Rule 520.2.5, which tells her not to date any club patrons unless she has a great desire to be immediately dismissed. Not only are these and many other rules established, but Playboy goes to great lengths and expense to enforce them. Consider Rule 520.2 B and C. The Playboy Club is one of a long list of retail establishments, restaurants and nightclubs serviced by Wilmark Service Systems Inc. By having detectives visit each club, Playboy is, quote, truly able to tell which bunnies are doing a really good job. Playboy claims it is an obligation to prevent minor irregularities. Wilmark detectives are the first step towards educating our, our employees to be on their toes and to work with maximum efficiency at all times. C. You should know and constantly remember that Wilmark staff members will do everything possible to test the merit and mettle of our bunnies. They tempt the unwary to break rules and strain a girl's good disposition. Heavens to Betsy, they will try to date bunnies. How awful! But if a bunny is cheerful, kind, obedient, efficient, resourceful, kind to animals, and a militant non-mingler, she need not be concerned that she is, quote, from time to time being shopped by a Wilmark Service System representative. Shopped? Why such rules? Why instruct a bunny in exactly what she is to say and do? Why limit mingling, prohibit physical contact, and forbid dating anyone who has ever set foot in a Playboy club? What harm would be done? The supposedly high-class clientele of the club ought to make excellent beaux and husbands. The airlines, which also make use of pretty girls to attract and serve customers, put no such restrictions on stewardesses. And why go to the trouble and expense of hiring gumshoes to untrap the unwary bunny? to protect these sweet young things from the advances of lecherous males? 
Hardly. Not even the Playboy Bunny Manual suggests that. Rule 520.2a. The rules and regulations in this booklet have been designed to make absolutely sure that Playboy Club bunnies will always enjoy excellent reputations and that one or two bad apples will not spoil the good names of a great many fine young ladies. That is bunk. There is nothing about making the acquaintance of a patron or chatting with him or dating him that would ruin a fine young lady's reputation. That nonsense went out with high button shoes. Maybe the rules are intended to protect the good name of the Playboy Club. After all, many places prohibit unescorted women from sitting at the bar. Perhaps Playboy doesn't want the clubs to get a reputation as a place of assignation. Maybe, but I doubt it. The Playboy Clubs don't traffic in a high reputation anyhow. Not too many Sunday school classes attend. And I doubt if many clergymen recommend that their parishioners go there, unless they carry axes. <clears throat> Oops, sorry guys. <clears throat> Besides, plenty of dates are made. A club executive introduced me to a patron. I went out with him. He did not have in mind a visit to the Central Park Zoo, and the club official knew it. I hardly think my date was a Wilmark gumshoe either, but if he was, I hope he didn't put that hundred bucks he tried to give me on his expense account. The only reason for these absurd rules, I'm convinced, is to protect the customer. If the guy came, got into a situation where he was making out with a bunny or even thought he might make out, he'd never come back. He'd be scared to death. The rare guy who wouldn't be scared would immediately start to meet her elsewhere avoiding her place of work. Mingling, dating, would ruin business. More than that though, <clears throat> the rules maintain the illusion. The guy can look, but no physical contact. He can dream, but not mingle. No pass, no action is possible. Therefore, none is required of him. And if he thought he could date the girl, she, she no longer would be a nice young lady and that fantasy would go poof. Hence, the bunny doesn't say, it's good to see you, for that would convey a little too much eagerness and intimacy. It might frighten him. She doesn't say, what'll you have, for he might feel compelled to say, you, honey, and get himself into difficulties. She doesn't say or do any number of things for precisely the same reason. I believe this. Most patrons of the Playboy Club are married. If single, they're there with dates. If the guy was on the make, he would go where the action was. What kind of men would want to sit and look at cleavages? Most men want to play it safe. The realities of making out with a bunny for most men are great expense, lies, cheating, and divorce. Besides, he strongly suspects she is a whore who wants to put the mark on him. How much better to dream, to wish, to hope. And the Playboy clubs, like the Playboy magazine, give it to him by the ton. Many other rules enforce the fantasy. The bunny may not be seen eating or drinking. Dream girls do not have bodily functions. She may smoke, a handy phallic symbol, but she must puff and put the cigarette in an ashtray. She may not hold it. The Freudians would have a field day with that one. She may not sit. She perches on the back of a chair. She does not bend over the table to serve the food and drink. She does the bunny dip by, according to the manual, arching her back as much as possible, then bending the knees to whatever degree is necessary, raising the left heel as you bend the knees. Why such an awkward stance? The common assumption is that the bunny dip is necessary lest the girl's boobies fall out of her costume. Perhaps in a few rare cases, but the real reason I believe is to keep the bunny from too close proximity to the customer. It changes their relationship. He might bolt. The bunny is always gorgeous. Her hair, makeup, nails, costume are always to be perfect. If they are not, she is penalized. Appearance is important to the fantasy. Whoever dreamed about a sloppy girl? But the key to the image is the costume. The bunny costume, according to Playboy, consists of a, quote, smart satin suit custom designed for you alone, Rabbit ears, cotton tail, cuffs with Playboy cufflinks, 
collar with bow tie, name medallion, heels, and hose. <clears throat> Your bunny costumes and accessories are furnished to you by the Playboy Club. <clears throat> with the exception of the dyed to match shoes, which you purchase, and the special hose, which are provided for you at cost. From the eye point of Playboy and the customer, the bunny costume is sheer genius. The body of the costume consists of one piece which you step into. The leg holes are cut out. The leg holes are cut so that the sides come to the top of the hip bones. The effect is to create the illusion of a girl with very long legs, encased in black nylons, a la the Varga cartoons. The scooped out sides mean that a good bit of the fanny is revealed and necessitates some judicious shaving in front. The bodice of the costume is engineered so as to pull the breasts together and push them up. The total effect of the costume on the eye of the beholder is that of a perky little chick. Forgive me, perky little bunny with long legs, deep cleavage, and cunning little bottom, accentuated with a puffy cotton tail. The high heels are necessary because men have a thing on high heels. The rabbit ears add a touch of humor. The collar and cuffs suggest primness. See, she's a nice girl after all. The effect of the leggy, bosomy, bottomy girl on men is perfect. They are excited by her, but not shocked. If Hafner had put the bunnies in bikinis or left them topless, the effect would have been negative. She would have become a tramp, an available tramp. Men would have been scared, business lousy. This way, he gets to look at the top halves of a lot of bosoms, the sides of many derrieres, and a forest of gams. And it all comes out nice and naughty. The costume, mine, were pink and powder blue. May be great for Playboy and the patrons, but it is hell for the girls. As far as I'm concerned, the costume is a mid-20th century Iron Maiden. It is basically a corset. It has stays built into it like grandma used to wear. They squeeze you in at the waist and push your tummy both up into your chest and down into your hips. Since I hate to wear a bra or girdle, the bunny costume was torture for me. But being constantly corseted was the least of it. The bunny costume is rigid. It doesn't move. You have to move to fit it. If I stood up straight with my shoulders back as I was taught, I didn't fill the bra cups. Girls will understand this, but men may not. You see, when a girl stands up straight, it pulls her breasts up and flattens them a little. It looks nice, but not in the bunny costume. There are the rigid cups standing out there half filled. So I had to stand with my shoulders slumped forward so my breasts would sag into the cups. Just try standing for eight hours, shoulders forward, waist pinched in so your rear end sticks out, and wearing four inch heels. Oh, did I get back aches? I know many girls did. There's also the problem of exposure. There are laces on the sides of the costumes to regulate the amount of hip exposed. I tried to keep mine below the hip bone. It was more comfortable. Some girls wore them higher, letting the stays ride on the bone. But then they had the exposure problem. A lot of people think girls' breasts fall out. Not really. Only the bosomy girls had the problem. The bunny at the gift counter was one. She was always pulling and tugging at her costume. Despite all her efforts, a booby would pop out every so often. She did a brisk business. Most girls are not bosomy, nor do they need to be. The costume, together with some padding, creates the illusion of breasts. In general, just about any girl could wear the costume. She could be flat, but not fat. With that hourglass corset, there isn't much place to put flab. Of course, she needs reasonably good legs and a very strong back. The bunny, according to Playboy, is supposedly a glorification of the American girl. As the manual puts it, Rule 520.1, Indeed, the bunny is so much a glorification of the American girl in the tradition of the famous Ziegfeld girl that the word bunny has become a synonym for a beautiful and glamorous young lady. Really now. In truth, the whole bunny bit is a denial of femininity and a repudiation of the American girl. Her figure, no matter how perfect, is not good enough. The legs have to be made longer by including the hip. 
The waist has to be pinched in smaller, the bosom pulled in and pushed up and padded out. The words, she says, have to be limited, as if she were chatty Cathy with a record inside. Her actions have to be curtailed so that she has no bodily functions and little proximity. The result is an utterly phony creation of Hugh Hefner, a mindless, emotionless robot who doesn't even look like a girl. That Hefner and Playboy consider this creature a synonym for a beautiful and glamorous young lady, and that so many American men and women agree with him is, well, let's just say that I find it difficult to understand. That the creation of this phony little zero is hard on the real girl, including both wearing the Iron Maiden and acting like your head is full of lead, and that nobody much gives a damn about it is, well, let's say somebody ought to have a long chat with his head shrinker about why he really hates women. If the bunny is truly the glorification of the American girl, if what is desirable is not true femininity and honest sexiness, but fantasy, then a sophisticated, urban, urbane, emancipated American male deserves what he gets. I admit that the way I feel about being a bunny now is not the way I felt in the beginning. For the first couple of months, I was sure I was one of the chosen, the apex of glamour, one of the most desirable and beautiful women in the world, tuned in, tuned, turned on, one of the beautiful people. At last, I was having a real adventure in the new world. I was so excited. During this time, I rather consistently violated rule 520.2.4. Bunnies are forbidden to date employees of the club. This rule applies to room directors, office personnel, bartenders, musicians, and performers. I guess I dated all those. My love life, or is it sex life, will come up later in the book, but no discussion of bunnies and playboy clubs would be complete without describing what else goes on besides drinking and eating and bunny dipping and cleavage watching. I want it understood, though, that I'm writing about only one bunny, me. I don't know a thing about the intramural activities of a single other bunny. If Mr. Hefner insisted upon it, I'd be willing to believe that every other bunny but me was as pure as the driven snow on a garbage dump. It's true, I dated club employees, but a particular, if not necessarily peculiar meaning must be attached to the word date. You see, the male employee of the Playboy Club tends to look upon the environs as his private preserve that is well stocked with bunnies and has no limit on the bag. He's very possessive about his preserve. Oh, he'll share his largesse with his friends. Yes, sir, Salve, this is Marco. But he wants it clearly understood from whom such generosity stems. <coughs> After all, he works with the girls every day. He knows them well. They have a common bond of gripes. He has the proximity denied the patron. Why not take advantage of it? Why not indeed? The problem of the male Playboy Club employee, or maybe it's the girl's problem, is that he, more than anyone else, is a victim of the fantasy. He's the prototype of the Playboy. Here's a whole building full of gorgeous girls, each one alive, breathing, and atomic anatomically equipped personification of the fantasy. She's beautiful. She's sexy. She's emancipated. She wants him. If she isn't and doesn't, he concludes there's something wrong with her and forgets about her. To him, the object of a date is not love and romance, friendship or fun, but no, not even sex. To him, a girl is a seminal vessel. Put it this way. Among the playboys of this world, Caesar had it wrong when he said, I came, I saw, I conquered. To a playboy, it's, I saw, I conquered, I came. Is any girl born knowing this? I sure wasn't. But whatever else might be said about me, I learned. I got to be an expert on playboy types. For the first couple of months, when I was a beautiful people, I thought playboys were the whole bag. I figured I was really with it. 
My mistake was, oh, never mind. Let's just leave this subject for now. After a couple of months, my excitement began to be replaced by something else. I was a door bunny. From 11.15 a.m. until 7.45 p.m., with one 45-minute break, I stood by the door. I could also perch on a stool. Greeted customers, smiled, and said, Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. That's it. That's all. Nothing else. I was the first bunny seen when the guy entered the door. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. There were no predictable reactions. Uh, there were predictable reactions. If it was the guy's first visit to a club, he stared at my boobies like a bride peering at a hope chest. Then he'd look me in the eye, trying to act as though that much cleavage was a common event in his eyesight. If he was a regular customer, he'd make a quick check to see if the boobies were still there, then feel absolutely compelled to make some terribly witty remark like, well, I see you're still here, Salve. Or, you're in great shape today, Salve. Referring to me by name was a prerequisite. After all, he was one of the beautiful people, too. I used to stand there by the door, feet aching, back killing me, forcing a smile, and saying, Good afternoon, welcome to the Playboy Club. I thought I'd blow my mind. I have a low threshold of boredom anyhow, and this was the most stultifying occupation imaginable. My only diversion was to answer the phone. I was to say, hello, this is the Playboy Club. But I get so mentally blank, so mechanical, that I get my wires crossed and give the telephone greeting at the door and the door speech on the phone. Ring-a-ling. Good afternoon, welcome to the Playboy Club. I felt like an empty-headed nothing, a thing on exhibition, going nowhere, doing nothing. At Cost Cobb, I felt trapped by two demoniacal youngsters. Now I was trapped again by something worse. Dull, deadly, deadening boredom. Aside from the nothingness of the activity, there is another reason why I, at least, found it hard to be a bunny. Playboy is a hard outfit to work for. There is a holier-than-thou attitude, a sanctimoniousness, a self-consciousness, as if Playboy alone possesses the holy grail. Made of skin, I guess. It is this quality, rather than the rules themselves, which make being a bunny a little hard to stomach. Some examples from the manual will show this. Rule 520.4, hours. All bunnies work an eight hour shift unless instructed otherwise. They are to be exactly on time with costume flawlessly arranged. Rule 520.4.1, time cards. In those clubs where we have time cards, bunnies are responsible for punching in their own time cards when properly costumed and ready to go to work. A bunny may not punch in before she is ready to go on the floor. No bunny is permitted to punch in or out for another bunny, even if that bunny is standing at her side. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. What do I do with the card after I punch it? Rule 520.4.3 breaks. Bunnies are to take breaks only when authorized and only with full knowledge of the room director and lobby director. The bunny must see that another girl covers her station during her break and be sure that her break in no way interferes with service in the club. Rule 520.5 .5, Absenteeism. Habitual absenteeism is the cause for dismissal. The club realizes, the manual claims, that sometimes there are unreasonable... sorry unavoidable reasons for absence. If the bunny is unable to work as scheduled, it is her responsibility to find a replacement. That isn't easy. The bunny is to obtain a copy of the schedule from the bunny mother and make sure it is an up-to-date schedule. If she is to be absent on a working day, she must check the schedule to see who has a regular day off that day. Then she arranges for one of the bunnies to take her shift. Both, both bunnies must notify the bunny mother of the plan change. When obtaining a replacement, a bunny must check with the bunny mother to find out if the replacement is suitable. For example, a bunny who works a showroom must get a replacement who is qualified to work a showroom, not someone who has never worked this type room. After getting a replacement, she must notify the bunny mother, and naturally the bunny replacement also has to call the bunny mother. Now, children, we will have a brief explanation of menstruation. Rule 520.12 Personal hygiene. Good grooming starts with a daily bath and a good deodorant. 
The bunny is advised that regular usage of body lotion will keep her skin softer and prettier looking, and that special attention must be given to her hands and nails, i.e. she must make sure they are always clean and well manicured. All bunnies failing to take a daily bath will pay particular attention to the rule 520.2.8, mingling. Rule 520.15, the bunny mother. A bunny mother is stationed at every Playboy club to coordinate and supervise the work of the bunnies. Her position is similar to that of a college advisor, and you will find her a trusted and unofficial confidant. For whom? All these little asides are kind of there in italics of like Salve's little thoughts that she's adding, just to clarify that. So she said, for whom? Rule 520.16, dressing room conduct. Bunnies will see to it that the dressing room is clean and neat at all times. Bunnies are also urged to make sure that trash goes into proper receptacles. The dressing room is the only place where bunnies are permitted to sit, relax, or have bodily functions. But they are not to interfere with girls who are preparing to go on or off duty. Rule 520.16.1, lockers. Each bunny is assigned a locker and combination lock, a duplicate of which will be kept by the bunny mother. Be especially careful to place your shoes inside the locker when you go on duty so that they will not be a safety hazard lying around on the floor. What's happening on the floor? My favorite rule, 520.16.2, bulletin board. It is your responsibility to examine the bulletin board every day for any new instructions or notices which might be posted. I could hardly wait. Then there is the demerit system. The schedule of demerits is too long to reproduce here, but a few items might illuminate the system. Most serious offense was failure to report to work without a replacement. This earned 25 demerits. A third offense and you were out on the street. You could be up to five minutes late without demerits, but any longer earned demerits on a graduated scale. 20 minutes late, 7 demerits. 31 minutes late, 10 demerits. An hour, 20 demerits. The same demerit schedule applied if you were tardy to bunny meetings. Insubordination, 15 demerits. Improper conduct, such as drinking any liquid or eating, 10. Improper appearance, such as unkempt hair, improper makeup, improper costume, unmatched shoes, dirty nails, 5 demerits. Overstaying break, a demerit a minute. If you got 100 demerits, the pink slip. Demerits were wiped out at the end of the year or by earning merits. Merits were earned by getting votes in the Bunny of the Week contest, working on days off, working unpaid Playboy promotions, and pushing drinks. In Playboy parlance, the latter was known as the Good Service Contest, with the minimum number of patrons being served as 30 in an eight-hour shift. Despite all the rules, the gumshoe, the system of penalties, Playboy insists, Rule 520.1a, we are a friendly, relaxed organization. <laughs> According to Playboy, Rule 520.1f, you will find a quality of friendship seldom encountered in other areas of employment. Bunnies, we are told, share apartments, spend leisure time shopping, sightseeing, and vacationing together. Perhaps some did, but I did not. I've never been too much on girlfriends. I never seem to know what to talk to girls about. In the locker room, there was always a lot of chatter and giggling. Some girl would come in with a new wiglet or fall. There'd be a big fuss, oohs and ahs, and squeals, and scrambles to try it on, and isn't it darling, and where did you get it, and how much did it cost? I just couldn't see what all the fuss was about. A wig's a wig, a wig's a wig's a wig. So I stayed out of it. I came in, tried to find a halfway clean dressing table among all the litter that violated Rule 520.16, put on my makeup, got undressed for work, putting my shoes carefully in the locker, and showed up for work. Good afternoon, welcome to the Playboy Club. I never did fraternize very much, and I never did find any much quality of friendship, but that may be my fault. I was a bunny for 13 months. I cannot say I enjoyed every minute of it. But where also could I earn $150 a week for saying, 
Good afternoon. Welcome to the Playboy Club. And that is the end of chapter three. So thank you guys for listening. We will continue with chapter four next time. Let me know if you guys want to do a recap of these two chapters and chat about them separately. Or if you just want to go on to the next chapter. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you next time.